to make the encoding quite small. Um, so it actually takes up less space than the corresponding 886 assembly board. This is the language, this is the virtual machine that we're built for referencing memory and winding through symbol structures. Um, so we've got a dynamic linker built in more, and we want to fake a catch handler somewhere so we can return to where we want. Um, unfortunately, there are some limitations to what the dwarf unwinding lets us do. Not all of the registers are uh, poly saved. So in x86-64, arguments are generally passed with ESI, EDI, etc. cetera, and registers. And those registers aren't poly saved. We don't actually have direct control over them. Um, so what we did for this Trojan is we found, it, so this is unfortunately specific to a particular build of libc. Um, with the commonality of distros like Ubuntu, with regular release schedules and so on, there are actually, you, there, are only, there aren't that many choices for the different builds that you'll find in most cases. Um, so if you know anything about your target, this isn't that big a deal. Um, also, because we can read arbitrary memory, um, if you have any means of getting target data into a program, any means of getting some data into a program somewhere, we can find it with more. Uh, so you can actually give parameters to your exploit. Um, so you could, for example, have code supporting several different versions of libc and choose at runtime which one you're actually going to use. So um, think of it this way. Our execution environment is the exception handling virtual machine, and there are several of those around. So the architectures, architectures, the platforms, are not quite available. <coughs> but you can find on which one you are uh, and use the appropriate thing. So here, this is uh, assembly code from exec VPE in libc, and we're setting up a call to exec VPE using um, registers that we can control. So this is a nice place for us to jump to, because you can control uh, R12, RBX, R14. So we put the name of the symbol we wanted Dwarf to find, um, and the arguments that we want to pass to VE into extra space and GCC accept table. Um, generally, when GCC compiles something, it actually will put some extra space in the GCC accept table section. Um, for alignment reasons. So you've got a little bit of space to play with and you can put whatever you want in there and you don't have to move around any of the else sections. And you don't have to have those explicit strings in there because with the virtual machine, you can actually obfuscate it just fine. So this is uh, basically for your uh, visual enjoyment. And the, the GC accept table is never parsed as a whole. Um, an FDE that refers to it just as a pointer to some location in it that's interpreted as an LSDA structure, but there's never anything that's going to read the whole GC accept table and validate its format against something. So arbitrary data in there somewhere, you can even overwrite a information for an LSDA that you know is never going to be used if you want to, um, and nothing's going to actually validate against it unless it's used. Yeah, um, so good luck scanning uh, binaries for that. You'll have to dig out uh, the HP defunct ABI manual and a bunch of uh, GCC mailing list uh, posts. Um, so we, we found the location we see we want to return to. We found some registers we want to set up. Um, so here's the dwarf script for actually doing that. Uh, you see we set that, um, so we, we know in what, this is a Trojan. So we know in what location in the GC accept table we put our arguments to get the, uh, so we just set up R14 to take the address of our left bin slash bash string. Um, I use bash because on my system and probably many of your systems, sh, because I was doing this demo with set UID, uh, sh ignores the effective privilege level. Uh, so we, we also set up uh, R3 to the arguments, uh, the arguments for more arguments for ZBE, um, more arguments for ZBE. So now we execute our return to libc attack. We put all the arguments in the registers uh, in the dwarf code, and th th this is all uh, during the exception handling, um, during the unwinding, these registers are filled in because we're pretending that this is how to restore the register state for the next frame in the call stack. Um, so we set up all the registers, we've located where we want to go to. Um, so we, we can't actually modify the GC accept table for libc. So it would be nice to just jump into that place in libc. 
but we don't have any way of doing that easily. Um, we have to go to somewhere that we can control the GCC accept table for. So that's the program that we're crafting the Trojan for. Um, so that's why we need to return. We modify a landing pad to put us in right before a write instruction, and we set up a stack so that we'll go back into where we want to in Lib C. Um, we go back up to program code. Um, you know, down there at the bottom of main, we're going to be returning. We're going to do stuff. We'll be returning. Put plenty of write instructions. Uh, we just set them up. And we run this, and then we get a shell. So that's what I showed in the demo at the beginning. So there are some limitations to this, as I've been alluding. Um, we can't play with the registers that aren't callie saved. Um, <coughs> entering the arbitrary arguments can be different. So this is one place where x86 and x86 64 differ considerably, uh, because the calling conventions are quite different. Um, there are things that are easier and harder about full. Uh, because there's some limits to what we can write to the stack, um, it can be hard to set up a lot of stack-based arguments in x86. On the other hand, when we can set up stack-based arguments, um, it's significantly easier because those can be used as arguments uh, directly rather than worrying about registers that we can't control. Um, so you can actually go to the beginning of a function instead of finding some code snippet, <coughs> as I did, uh, in the middle of a function. Um, there's, we don't want to be modifying this help too much. Uh, we just want to be modifying the couple sections that we're interested in. So there is some limited space to work with because we don't want to be re um, having to re move, move sections around as we make some section too big. Um, however, each frame is going to contain an FTE for every function in the program because the analysis to determine whether or not a given function might ever be on the call stack when there's an exception and unwinding might have to pass through that function would be pretty icky. And GCC doesn't make any attempt to do that. It just generates unwinding information for all functions. Um, but we can be a little smarter about it. Um, whether or not we have the source code in the program, we can do some analysis and figure out whether <coughs> the unwinding information actually has to exist for that function. Um, and if it doesn't, we can just get rid of those FTEs in more script. Yes. More so we have a lot of extra space to add in our likely program, uh, dwarf expressions or whatever. Of course, we have the benefit of seeing the whole graph of the target and seeing which uh, stack frames exception handling would clearly not pass through. In a shared object, and you're loading a whole lot of shared objects uh, dynamically into your process image. Well, uh, in shared objects, uh, there is no such uh, advantage. So GCC quite naturally puts the information about each step frame into the each frame of shared objects. So, so crafting one of these dwarf trojans is a little bit difficult to debug. Um, when I was working on this one, I spent a lot of time just stepping through the virtual machine execution in libgcc, uh, um, which can be a little painstaking. At some point, if I'm not too lazy, I make it around to actually turn a debugger or dwarf script. Uh, and as I alluded to, there are some assumptions that are specific to a target system. Uh, there are times when I was using particular byte offsets of things that happen in certain versions of libc, certain versions of lib standards. Um, so the techniques can be applied to just with any version, but the exact offsets you need to use can change. But of course you can parameter it. Let's have another virtual machine on top of the virtual machine that will load its description. So everything I've discussed so far deals with valid ALP files, valid dwarf sections. Everything is playing exactly within the rules. But what if we don't play entirely within the rules? Um, what if our dwarf data violates some of the assumptions made by the VM? Um, and this work is not particularly advanced. This is definitely work in progress. Um, oops, wait a minute. Um, so, uh, so in libgcc, as we're handling the instructions, there isn't always a lot of input validation done. Um, in here, we can see that um, we're accessing an array based on a parameter that was read from the dwarf data. Um, so if we have some corrupted dwarf data, we've got a not completely arbitrary memory write that's subject to some alignment restrictions, um, but we can write a word at a number of different locations. Um, so I have a question. How do you unwind a sword? Uh, sign word. Um, so Sorry. 
uh, we, if we need extra places to set up data um, for where we're turning into, et cetera, we can use things like this to do that. Um, now, this could obviously be fixed with some checking in GCC. Uh, so this, this particular vulnerability may go away. But in general, uh, that virtual machine treats each frame as friendly and well formed. There isn't really that much checking. So it would be particularly nice if we could put in some sort of fake EH frame uh, at runtime. Uh, much as we're doing with Trojan statically, uh, we could do the same sort of thing at runtime. So think about how good GCC knows where to find the EH frame. Um, it's actually, there's a separate EH frame header section, which is not part of the more standard, it's part of the Linux standard space, x 64 ABI. Um, and that points EA train, and that is found by program header uh, JNU EA train. So, what's interesting is that libgcc will cache this value. Uh, so, if we overwrite that value, um, so w w once the first exception is thrown, the value will be cached. Um, and if we can overwrite it after that, then the next time an exception is thrown, we can use our EA train that we pointed this pointer to. Um, Unfortunately, this inject, this uh, overwriting is fairly non-trivial. This is not an exported symbol in any way. Um, it's, just, it's static. Um, so you will always be at the same location for a given build, ignoring ASLR, but ASLR, and always at the same location relative to the base library for a given build. Um, but it changes with the build, and it changes with the ASLR. Uh, so you need some sort of to have the exploit uh, ahead of that to get the data you need to overwrite that pointer. Um, but if you manage to hold that for loop, then you have uh, a completely general mechanism for resolving any symbols you like, any symbols that are in the dynamic segment and drive the dynamic control <coughs> here. Uh, moreover, you will have uh, shell code, which has none of the executable uh, native uh, binary. So this is it's significantly harder to get into at runtime than return-oriented programming. It's harder than a stack pivot. Um, but on the other hand, once you do get in there, you don't have to mess around with finding lots of different gadgets because the dwarf can do all of those computations uh, without needing any executable code anyway. Uh, so the beauty of this is that in the return-oriented programming, you have to import code that was not meant to be used uh, for your gadgets, obviously. Uh, here, if you manage to execute your uh, exception handling bytecode, the VM executing that, uh, that's hidden in the uh, exception handler, is meant to do it, and it's perfectly debugged and all that. Um, so what, one way we may be able to find uh, the location overwrite, if we do have some kind of exploit already, is that after an exception is handled, there will be locations of libgcc, uh, which this value will exist as a offset from, uh, below the stack in the unused areas of the stack. Um, and I don't, I don't yet have a working group of concept showing using that, um, but it's a promising avenue. So just to finish up, um, there's a lot more work to do. We demonstrated a Trojan technique, but there are some interesting paths forward for turning this into more. Um, if you have some older GCC versions.